the T-34, a World War II armored legend, 1943-1945. Clouds of smoke are rising above the steppe. Heavily breathing, sweating, and choking, the German Panzer crew are lining up their sights over the silhouettes approaching from the distance. The TZF-5F gun sight is adjusted, just waiting for the command to fire. A Panzergranata 40 armor-piercing projectile has been loaded into the gun breech, ready to fly at over 900 meters per second. The Panzer commander is listening to the radio chatter. Everyone seems to be on edge. There are many silhouettes closing in. Finally, the order is given to fire. The shell flies out, and it takes less than a second to hit the enemy tank. The T-34 is hit, and it stops abruptly, smoking and starting to burn. The tank crew evacuate their disabled vehicle, while dozens of other T-34 tanks are streaming past them. They're all rushing forward, trying to close in and push back the German troops. An entire guard's tank army is attacking down the hill 252.2. Facing them are the elite troops from the 1st SS Panzer Division, Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, Panzer Threes and Fours, Tigers, Pax, Hummels, Vespas, and their Panzer Grenadiers are dug in and experienced in fighting enemy tanks. The Germans were tired but confident. They have recently thrown out the Soviet defenders from the Oktyabrsky farm, and they now occupy favorable positions. In the ensuing fight, one could hardly recognize and distinguish friend from foe. Soviet tanks had driven straight into the German panzer formations, trying to mitigate German armor and tactics. This close combat lasted for hours. Tanks would ram each other, explode, and send turrets flying off. The T-34s would destroy German artillery from point-blank range before being destroyed themselves. Even the Tigers were not immune from such a close range. Several were hit and disabled. To add to the confusion, some T-34s had run into the anti-tank ditch that was dug up by their comrades previously and got stuck. Others were trying to bypass it and became an easy target for the German tanks and anti-tank guns. Chaos and mayhem ensued. The climactic battle would be interrupted by some mid-afternoon heavy rainfall. Hundreds of T-34 tanks were scattered around, partially or completely destroyed or disabled. Losses were high, reminiscent of the 1941 tank battles in the opening stages of Operation Barbarossa. However, the German advance had stalled. Operation Citadel has failed to achieve its goals, and a rapid advance was not possible. The Red Army had yet much to learn. The T-34 tanks had been forced on a narrow corridor between the railway line and the Passel River. The entire tank army had to be echeloned, making them easy targets for the Germans who were ready and waiting for them. The lack of radios, firing on the move, and constant Luftwaffe air attacks were also increasing the death toll. Fortunately, the Soviets had something new being developed, but until it was available, they would have to fight on with everything they could muster up, including the older, out-of-date tanks. Up until 1942, the T-34 tank had been a formidable opponent, but by 1943, the German army had the means and machines to counterattack the threat. The Panzer IV had already received a longer 75mm gun and reinforced armor. The Panzer III in its latest J variant was already using a longer 50mm gun. The Pac-40 had good penetration and ballistic capabilities, being able to knock out T-34 tanks from a fairly good range. The Stug III and Martyr series were also becoming more and more effective. The Tiger was already well known and had a fearsome reputation. The new vehicles, which made a combat debut at Kursk, like the Ferdinands and Panthers, did have their drawbacks but they were gaining in experience and reputation and becoming worthy adversaries. The Soviet Union had their T-34 and KV tanks to counter them. By 1943, the T-34 was already a solid tank, with its many deficiencies fixed and problems resolved. The factories were evacuated behind the Urals and in Siberia and were keeping up with the demand and increasing their output every day. The workers were also getting better and more experienced, so less defects were observed as the time progressed. However, some problems were still present. Above all, the main gun was not as potent as it was in the early stages of the war. 
tests conducted in April 1943 showed that the Tiger was nearly invulnerable from the front, except at a very close range. The F-34 gun was simply not capable of dealing with it, and at the same time the Tiger had a devastating effect on the T-34. From a distance of one and a half kilometers, the Tiger was able to not only penetrate the T-34 frontal armor, but could also shatter the plates and displace the turret. Thus, in May 1943, a decree was issued to develop new tank weapons that were capable of dealing with this threat. There was a gun more potent than the F-34, which had already shown its capabilities. The 52K anti-aircraft gun was used on many occasions as an effective anti-tank weapon. Its 85mm shell had the potency to penetrate more than 100mm of armor at a range of over one kilometer. This was sufficient enough to increase the Soviet tank force's chances of inflicting damage to the heavily armored German tanks. Therefore, Soviet designers had used this cannon as a basis to develop a tank version indexed as the D-5T. Even before the T-34 tank was armed with an 85mm gun and put into production, another vehicle on the T-34 chassis had received this weapon. A self-propelled gun indexed SU-85 was developed and produced at Erlmash from mid-1943. It would be a stopgap solution until a medium tank with similar firepower could be introduced. Soviet designers were quick to implement it due to the fact that something similar was already achieved a year before. The SU-122 had been developed featuring a 122mm howitzer mounted onto a T-34 chassis. The solution had been quite simple. Start with a T-34 chassis, mount a howitzer on it, and reuse as many components as possible. The quality of the final product and its field performance did show some drawbacks and problems, but in general, the Red Army had received quite a good mobile artillery gun. The 122mm shell was more than capable of seriously damaging even a Tiger tank. It had a low silhouette, potent gun, and generally became a positive and welcome addition for the infantry and as a tank support. Therefore, a similar idea was used for the Su-85, using the same chassis and mounting a new gun. Several variants were proposed, including one with a 107mm gun, but the winner was an Su-85 with the D-5T gun. There were a lot of problems with them, such as cracks in the armor, a cramped interior, engine and transmission defects. Their losses were quite high initially, though, because they were being used like tanks. But as soon as they started following a couple of hundred meters to the rear, their losses decreased and their kill count increased. So the gun was there, and the chassis was there. However, mounting a gun this big onto the already cramped old turret would be very difficult. A project had already been developed before this, named the T-43. The Soviet leadership had already recognized the threat of the new German weaponry back in 1942. To counter it, a project of a new tank that would bring together the mobility of the T-34 and the armor protection of the KV-1 was developed. It was supposed to protect the tank from the 75mm long-barreled Panzer IV while keeping the same F-34 cannon for the sake of current productivity and production quotas. This compromise was not very successful. Even though the T-43 armor was superior to the T-34s, it was still not sufficient enough to protect it against the 88mm gun, fired from either the Tiger or the Flak anti-aircraft gun version. At the same time, it was obvious that the F-34 cannon was incapable of dealing with the latest German tanks, especially after the Kursk battle. However, there was something good in this project that was warmly welcomed by the crews. The new three-man turret would allow for the installation of a bigger gun and a dedicated commander. Before that, the two-man turret of the T-34 was not only cramped, but it had put a lot of stress on the commander, being responsible for commanding the tank and acting as a gunner at the same time. Now, the crew could be increased to five, where a tank commander could actually do his job, observing the battlefield, guiding, ordering, and commanding the tank. Thus, the turret was taken from the T-43 project. It wasn't copied, but rather the general shape and ideas were used. It did, however, require expanding the turret ring diameter from 1425 mm to 1600 mm. Another good change was the placement of the radio. It moved from the hull to the turret, therefore increasing the efficiency and ease of use. The turret armor was increased to 90 mm. However, the size and silhouette did increase, while the angle of armor decreased. 
This would have negative consequences on the armor protection and strength, even creating shell traps, but it was a well-thought-out compromise. The increased armor thickness would compensate for these changes. Now that the tank had the turret, the gun could be selected and installed. The gun chosen was the same as the one on the Su-85, the D-5T. It was developed based on the M1939 52K anti-aircraft gun. This cannon had already proven potent and had good penetration capabilities. It could potentially penetrate a Tiger tank's frontal armor from over one kilometer. It was not enough as the Tiger was completely capable of knocking out the T-34 from a distance of up to two kilometers. But compared to the F-34 gun, which was totally incapable of knocking out a Tiger from the front, it was a very big leap forward and it gave the T-34s a fighting chance. This gun wouldn't stay as a definitive choice for long, though. Another gun was chosen as well, the ZIS S53 gun of the same 85mm caliber, but with a slightly better performance, though the production was a bit delayed until problems with its recoil mechanism were resolved. The ZIS gun is also less complicated to produce. The tank chassis was mostly unchanged from the previous versions. The engine was still the same, the V2 diesel, but the fuel capacity was increased to 810 liters, giving it an operational range of some 360 kilometers. Its weight did increase by one ton, from 30.9 to 32 tons, which did result in its top speed being reduced to 52 kilometers per hour. The tank stability was not really affected by the addition of the new larger turret, as the trials at Kubinka proved. The tank's ammunition capacity for the main gun went down to 55 to 60 rounds, compared to over 100 rounds stored in the T-34-76 model 1943. It might seem like a huge drop, but the 85mm shells were bigger, stronger, and heavier. Each standard shell was some 9.8 kilograms, compared to 6.5 kilograms for the 76mm shells previously used in the F-34. Some 20 rounds were stored in the turret, 16 of them in the ammo rack of the turret bustle, and 4 on the right rear side next to the gunner. The remaining shells were stored in the tank chassis in ammo boxes similar to the previous tank variants. The crew and the shells had no barriers between them, apart from the metal bins in which the rounds were stored, and a rubberized mat above them which potentially created a fire hazard. So, the T-34-85 would be ready for action in the first half of 1944, just in time for some major Soviet offense operations. But before that, the Red Army would have to get by with the previous variants. The Kursk battle was a real awakening for the Soviet leadership. Their tank formations had suffered horrendous losses in the course of the battle. Even to this day, historians are arguing about the magnitude of the German and Soviet losses, mostly in tanks and other armored fighting vehicles. At the battle at Prokhorovka on July 12, 1943, heavy losses were inflicted on the Soviet armored units, some of which had reported having only 50 tanks left out of 200. The German losses in that respect were much lighter, however. The Red Army could replenish their resources while the Germans had no such option. In addition to all of this, the Soviets had launched Operation Kutuzov in the northern part of the Kursk salient. German troops, already tired and depleted, were just not strong enough to resist this onslaught of Soviet troops, who were taking serious losses but were gaining the initiative, being mobile and numerous, attacking on several points and probing the weak points in German defenses. Eventually, the Germans would fall back to the Hagen Line. With the strategic initiative being taken from them, the Red Army would not lose this advantage on the Eastern Front for the remainder of the war. A bit later, Operation Pokovodets Rumyantsev was launched in the southern part of the Kursk salient, a testimony of how long it took the Red Army to replenish and re-equip after the huge losses it sustained in this particular sector during Operation Citadel. Its tank armies were depleted, and there had been too many casualties. However, fresh reserves were now arriving, and heavy battles took place there. Rumitstrov's 5th Guards tank army had managed to penetrate the German defenses and take on Bogodukov. It was there that a situation similar to Prokhorovka had occurred, where the German forces were outnumbered by the now reinforced troops of the Soviet 5th Guards tank army. However, the outcome was not the same. Romitstrov's T-34s took a beating and couldn't advance any further, but held the line and exerted heavy pressure upon the Army Group Kempf. The Germans were now threatened with encirclement in Kharkov and were running low on ammo, rations, and manpower, and contrary to Hitler's orders, started to pull out and evacuate. 
Kharkov was liberated on August 23, 1943, with the German troops fleeing westward through the narrow corridor, bombed and strafed by the Soviet Air Force and pummeled by Soviet artillery. In the following months, the Red Army would push the Germans back to the west, liberate huge parts of the Soviet Union, and fully utilize their big victory at Kursk. The T-34s would travel for many miles, fighting on the move, enduring severe conditions, liberating Kiev and much of the Ukraine, and finally stopping at the Pripyat marshes and the borders of Belarus. This is where some of the units would be reinforced with the new T-34-85 model tank and prepare for the next major Soviet offensive. By late 1943 and early 1944, it was obvious that the previous T-34 models, armed with the F-34 cannon, were no longer superior to the German tanks and weaponry of the same or similar classes. The tank simply needed a bigger gun and heavier armor. The Soviet tactics of tank utilization and organization were getting better with time, but the lack of radios and situational awareness for the tank commanders was taking its toll. And now, a word from our sponsor, World of Tanks. World of Tanks is a free-to-play PC game. Choose from a massive arsenal of tanks from across history and join over 100 million players who battle it out across 40 unique arenas. Whether you want to rush in, guns blazing, or hang back and take out opponents from afar, you can rally your teammates, jump in your T-34, and hunt down your opponents in giant online battles. With over 550 tanks to choose from and terrains from the open sands of the desert to the enclosed tangle of the jungle, there's always a new way to play. World of Tanks uses real historical designs to create authenticity and make you feel like a real tank commander. Earn experience, modify and upgrade your tank to take the lead in a furious armed offensive across a global community of players. Join World of Tanks today with the invite code TANKMANIA and receive one tank to add to your permanent collection, plus three rental tanks, 250k credits and seven days of premium access. German tank doctrine was well-tested and battle-proven. It would induce fear and respect in its opponents. The Red Army was still taking huge losses due to the aforementioned factors, combined with bad tactical decisions and a general lack of air support. Already in late 1943 and early 1944, some guards units were receiving their first small batches of the T-34-85. Tank crews were generally satisfied with the new tank. It was superior in many aspects to the T-34-76 and had left a good impression. In General Katukov's own words, it was a happy event infusing tank crews with optimism, psychologically reinforcing them and showing them that their new tanks were superior to their German counterparts, often praised for their quality by both sides alike. This new tank had performed well against the Panzer IV variants, but still had complications when it was up against the Panther tanks. Even though the Panther's side armor was not a problem for the T-34-85, the frontal armor was very thick, and it still had to get close to be able to penetrate it. On the other hand, the Panther had more options in direct frontal engagements, being able to penetrate the T-34-85's turret and gun mantlet from a greater distance. That advantage wouldn't last long, though. Just in time for the new Soviet summer offensive, the new BR-365P hypervelocity armor-piercing round would appear, giving the T-34-85 the option to combat Panther tanks head-on. Still, the Panther tanks were superior in some respects, coupled with the extensive training that their crews were receiving. However, with the introduction of the T-34-85, engagements had now stopped being so one-sided. By the time Operation Bagration was about to begin, many units had received substantial numbers of the T-34-85s and had the time to familiarize themselves with the new machines. Luckily, most of the tank systems and components were inherited from the previous tank variants, so the tank crews had less trouble getting around and learning new things. The biggest problem was the lack of manpower, lack of trained tank crew personnel, due to the losses sustained in previous years. Some tanks had fewer crew members than they were designated, so instead of five, some went with four or even three tankmen into the battle. This was gradually resolved by using the tank drivers from the factories and more recruitment, but the impact of losses in the previous years was still very strong. Ironically, what had happened on June 22, 1941 had reversed roles in 1944. The Soviet Army had attacked the German Army Group Center in Belarus. A total strategic and tactical surprise was achieved. The Soviet forces had decimated the German defenders and penetrated deep into their lines. 
After the initial heavy artillery bombardment, the Soviet infantry had managed to penetrate the German lines near Vitebsk, while the massed Soviet tank brigades rushed in, achieving a total strategic breakthrough. The T-34 tanks had shown their full potential concerning mobility and ruggedness, moving through the swampy terrain and having a good operational range. Soviet troops lacking armored transport, such as armored personnel carriers, were riding the tanks like they did in the previous years. The so-called Tankodesentniki were taking hard losses in the previous years, but had helped Soviet tank forces in their deep penetrations. Usually, they would ride on the tanks until contact was made with the enemy, or their objective was in sight, then jump off and follow the tanks into the assault. This was one of the reasons why the Soviet T-34s had railings to allow the mounted infantry to easily climb up onto their mounts and hold on tightly as they traveled at full speed. Operation Bagration was a great success for the Red Army, as was another operation that was launched, the Lvov Sandomir Offensive in July and August 1944. During the later stages of this operation, an interesting event occurred near the Polish village of Ogledow. A single T-34-85 tank commanded by Lieutenant Alexander Oskin from the 53rd Guards Tank Brigade, along with accompanying infantry, had the task of linking up with the elements of the 2nd Battalion in the area of the Ogledal village on August 11, 1944. Upon reaching the village, no friendly tanks were visible, but an approaching German column was noticed, so Oskin reversed back and hid the tank in a cornfield. He informed his superiors about the events and received an order to stay put and observe the enemy. His tank was already hidden in the cornstalks, but the crew and the infantry tank riders had camouflaged the tank turret in the same fashion. But having a single large stack of corn in the middle of the field would look odd, so they constructed several more of them to make it look less obvious. The next day, Oskin spotted some German tanks leaving Ogledow and advancing towards him. Being cool-headed, he had jumped into the tank and ordered his crew to hold fire until the enemy tanks got very close. When the column of three King Tigers was some 200 meters away, Oskin ordered his gunner to open fire. A hypervelocity round struck the second tank on the turret side. Oskin was unaware that some of the crew had already been killed, and he now ordered a regular armor-piercing round to be fired, and then another one. They appeared to have no effect on the Tiger, so he ordered another hypervelocity round to be fired, this time to the backside of the tank. Finally, the enemy tank started to burn. The lead tank had started to rotate its massive turret, trying to locate the ambusher. The Oskin crew proceeded to fire three rounds at the turret front, all of which just bounced off. However, the fourth round penetrated the turret ring. As a result, the King Tiger started to burn, and there was a massive explosion, and the turret was blown off due to the ammunition igniting inside the tank. The third King Tiger, now engulfed in smoke from the burning second King Tiger, had his vision obstructed and started to back off from the road. Oskin, thinking that the enemy would slip away, activated his own smoke canisters and started the chase. The King Tiger was slow, and he couldn't just run away. Oskin's T-34-85 had approached from the back and fired a round into the enemy tank's rear end, hitting its engine. Now the third King Tiger was knocked out and disabled. When Oskin's tank returned back to the ambush site, the second King Tiger had stopped burning, so his crew fired another round of hypervelocity ammunition into it and put an end to the tank. Three King Tigers were now wrecked, with zero Soviet casualties. Oskin had shown great tactical knowledge, cool-headedness, and nerve. His ambush not only stopped the German armored column, but it was exactly here that the King Tigers had made their debut on the Eastern Front. The result of this and of consecutive battles proved disastrous for the Germans. As time passed, the T-34-85 would come up against practically all the different types of enemy tank. Engagements with the Panzer IVs would usually end as a T-34-85 victory. But fighting against heavier German tanks was not always so predictable. German panzer units still had the tactical advantage in training and equipment quality, though they were increasingly running low on manpower, fuel, repairs, and air support. On the other hand, the Soviets and the Allies were constantly getting stronger and more experienced. The T-34-85, along with the other tanks, would face a new enemy in the later stages of the war a handheld anti-tank weapon called the Panzerfaust. 
which could exert a deadly toll on the T-3485s in urban combat. Many vehicles fell prey to this weapon, which was manufactured in huge numbers. It was easy to operate and gave the average infantryman the option to knock out tanks from short and medium ranges. The Panzerfaust was capable of destroying the T-3485 from any angle. The Volkssturm, Germany's last line of defense, were inadequate in a sustained firefight due to their advanced ages and inexperience, but were still capable of knocking out Soviet tanks with these weapons. Upon entering Berlin and other German towns, the Soviet tankmen had developed two new tactics. One tactic was grouping tanks and infantry together, trying to cover street angles, and as soon as a stronghold was reached, the tanks would pull back to a safe distance, behind the range of the Panzerfaust. The other tactics would include welding metal meshes onto the turret and tank body, hoping that it will prematurely detonate the Panzerfaust warhead. Soviet tank crews would do anything to increase their chances of survival. The T-3485 would fight until the end of the war in Europe, and when that was over it would continue fighting in the Far East against the Japanese, who were already weakened and generally lacked decent armored units, and were decimated under the Soviet army onslaught. They had no tanks that could match the Soviet ones. Interestingly enough, the frontline formations would include the T-26, BT-7, T-34s of all types, and the T-34-85 tanks, all working together. The troops fighting in the Far East would not dispose of their armored vehicles for the whole period of the war, so they had some which were woefully outdated by that time. In the second half of 1944, the Red Army would receive another potent vehicle made on the T-34 chassis. The Su-100 was a logical step forward from the Su-85. Its 100mm main gun was strong enough to pose a serious threat to any German tank or self-propelled gun that it might encounter. Combined with stronger frontal armor, which was the equivalent to 125 millimeters, the Su-100 was well-liked by the crews and could successfully carry out the numerous tasks required of it. The D-10 gun mounted on it was so powerful that even the post-war tanks continued to use it, like the versions of the T-54 and T-55. A major drawback of the Su-100 was the quality of its optics, but in general this self-propelled gun was a true success. During the war, the Soviet Red Army would utilize flamethrower tanks. It was not a new concept, though, as the older T-26 tanks had also been converted into flamethrowing vehicles. As for the T-34, all models had a variant with this feature. The OT-34 would be first in line, featuring an AT-041 flamethrower instead of a hull machine gun. It could fire a burst of flame 90 meters and had a fuel tank capacity of 105 liters which would allow some 10 bursts of flame. Due to the carnage and chaos encountered during the summer of 1941, the Red Army would not receive him until 1942. Later on, the variant AT-042 was introduced, increasing the range to 130 meters and an even larger fuel capacity. It would be replaced with the AT-043, increasing the range even further and also reduce the weight and complexity of the system. The T-3485 would also have a version designated as the OT-3485. Some 1,500 flamethrower tanks of all variants were made. The Germans would use any piece of equipment that they could get their hands on. The T-34 was no exception. Early captured variants were designated Panzerkampfwagen T-34-747R. The Germans would paint large crosses and swastikas all over it in order to make it look clear to the other Panzer crews and the Luftwaffe that this tank was one of their own. Barbarossa was a good example for reusing captured tanks. Many had just broken down or simply run out of fuel. The Germans would repair them if possible, rearm them, and put their new crews in them. However, using these tanks was not an easy feat taking into account that all the production facilities were in Soviet hands, apart from the Kharkov plant, which had been stripped of all its equipment, it was not easy to keep these tanks in running order. Some were simply used until they completely broke down, and some were salvaged for spare parts. Some captured T-34s had received German equipment and modifications. One common thing to add was the Notec blackout tail light. This made it possible to check the distance of the vehicle in front if you were in a convoy, especially in blackout or total darkness conditions. Some had extra Schurzen armored skirts. One of the frequent additions was a commander's cupola, taken from the Panzer III or Panzer IV. 
In general, though, the Germans were not very impressed with the captured tanks. They were damaged, worn out, cramped, and lacking suitable equipment. The Kharkov factory, now in German hands, was conducting some repairs under the supervision of the SS, but even that didn't last very long. But later, captured T-34s were repaired in a tank repair facility at Königsberg. Interestingly enough, though, the captured T-34 tanks were fighting practically until the end of World War II in Europe. One of the most interesting conversions was a Flakpanzer T-34. A T-34 tank chassis was taken, stripped of its turret, and fitted with a new one, housing the Fleckwieling 4x22mm anti-aircraft cannon. Surrounded by angled metal plates at the front and sides, the Germans had created a mobile anti-aircraft vehicle. The last known example of this vehicle existed before Operation Bagration, where it was probably destroyed. The T-34 tank production had started in January 1940 and would last for many years to come, the last model being produced in Czechoslovakia in 1958 as the T-34-85 variant. In this period, some 84,070 vehicles were produced, 35,120 of the T-34-76, and the rest, 48,950 being the T-34-85. A truly astonishing figure, taking into account all the hardships and problems that the Soviet Union was facing following the German invasion. It was superseded only by the T-55, the latter being the most produced tank in history. But still, Soviet factories had produced some 58,700 T-34s during the war, more than the entire German tank production which peaked at 46,000 armored fighting vehicles. If we add other tank types like the T-26, BT-7, T-28, and KV series, then the Soviet armored fighting vehicle production rose to 107,000 vehicles. It was clear that the Soviet tank production not only caught up with the German one, but surpassed it twofold. Production numbers themselves were not sufficient to win the war. German tank war doctrine concentrated on quality over quantity on technical superiority over production figures. Nazi Germany had fewer resources, be that production capabilities or fuel and manpower, but they concentrated on building a smaller but more elite and capable force. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, had more resources. Their war strategy dictated huge and massive armies and breakthroughs into the enemy rear, a so-called deep battle. The Red Army was named the Workers' and Peasants' Red Army, a name that had its roots in the formation of the force during the Russian Civil War. Thus, the Soviet technology was generally designed to perform in the harshest of conditions, but required less skill from its operators. Combined with the purges of the officer corps just before World War II, a sudden and disastrous German invasion and its consequences, the incompetence and misconduct among some of the senior Red Army officers, the losses in the Soviet tank force were enormous. Already in 1941, some 20,000 tanks had been lost. Most of these were the old tank types, but even with the new ones, losses were mounting. 15,000 in 1942, 22,400 in 1943, 16,900 in 1944. Only in 1945 did the Soviet losses compare to the German ones, being some 8,700. Around 44,900 T-34 tanks were lost in World War II, out of 58,700 produced, the highest loss ratio ever recorded. Therefore, the T-34 crews paid a heavy price for their victory in World War II. The tank had an excellent combination of so-called hard factors, armor, firepower, and mobility. This would give it a big advantage over the German tanks. However, the so-called soft factors were not satisfactory, and some were terrible. The ergonomics, vision, crew composition, and layout. The T-34 was a cramped, crude, and hard-finished tank. The crew had such bad visibility that in some cases, drivers had to navigate their tanks into battle with their hatch partially open. Another problem was the crew composition. The absence of a dedicated commander, or so-called two-man turret in the early versions, meant that the commander could not concentrate on fighting and directing his crew, but instead he had to do multiple tasks. Only when this issue was addressed with the T-3485 was there a positive impact on the combat losses and tank performance. Throughout the years, discussions and analysis were, and still are, raging whether the T-34 was the best tank of the war or was it better than this or that tank. 
The facts are that in single frontal engagements, the T-34 had a fighting edge in 1941 and also partially in 1942. Later on, it had lost its advantage due to the advancement in design of the enemy tanks. In the later stages of the war, the T-34 would start to increase its effectiveness again. However, taking only crude data into the analysis, one can get a bad and inaccurate picture. The fact is that the T-34 had done its bit to help win the war, just like the Sherman tank. It was a good design with some flaws, but the one that would fit the Soviet war doctrine and weather, as well as the environment. Thus, the T-34 had earned the right to be called a tank of victory. As a matter of fact, the war would continue for the T-34. The last conflict where the T-34-85 would be seen taking part was the Yemen Civil War, as recent as 2019, alongside the Su-100. It is a true testimony of how solid and durable these tanks were.